Testing. So you guys are just going to talk longer, and then we, you guys are going to talk longer, and we're going to get input from the audience, okay? Okay. Well, at least you get an audience. Okay. Time? Yeah, I called all my friends. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, welcome to the session on algorithmic transparency and the right to explanation. Um, we had planned a breakout groups session. Um, I, I don't know how you, the audience feels about breakout groups, but I'm thinking rather that we're gonna do a session in which we get input from the audience. Uh, could we have a vote on that? Should we break out, or are we just gonna spend half of the session getting input from the audience? So break out, hands up. Audi for that. Yeah. Break out. Uh, so you break out into groups and you discuss and you come back. Second option is we just get more audience participation in, in the event. So who's voting for break out? And for uh, audience participation? Okay, so I think it's a consensus. We're looking forward to, to, to what you have to say. Um, AI is a 62-year-old phenomenon. Um, it's big now in the hype cycle, and everybody's looking at it. Uh, the reason is probably the ecosystem with Internet of Things and big data is there, uh, and, and it's converging in a way that, that, that it makes money. AI is also very readily accessible for anyone to use. You can use machine learning on, on, on Amazon Web Services, on Google Cloud, locally on your computer. Um, and the conceptualization of artificial intelligence, of artificial intelligence, I, I think, is something that is quite important to, to unpack it. Because we see artificial intelligence in terms of uh, stereotypes, uh, 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 in, in, term, uh, in terms of movies, and we often see the extreme version of artificial intelligence, which are machines that can supposedly think like humans. Uh, a lot of what is referred to as artificial intelligence now is statistics and machines learning things, and, uh, but not machines thinking independently. So um, I think science fiction has given us problems <coughs> with conceptualization and that's what I want to gather from the audience is, is how do we unpack AI and how do we make AI understandable and systems explainable. So the, the GDPR uh, dictates that if you have your personal information subject to, to automated decision making without consent, that's not allowed. So uh, it, 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 there has to be a, a human there and you have to be able to explain it. Um, and the, the GDPR talks about a right to explanation. It doesn't say it in the terms of the, a right to explanation. But a right to explanation would mean that we can understand why a system has made a decision. Um, and there's a term algorithmic transparency, and that, that, that is to, to understand why the algorithms have made a decision and to, to make them transparent. Um, so we're going to discuss if that's possible today. My name is Alex Komnenis. I'm an independent researcher. Um, we have Imane Bello. She is a lecturer at Sciences Po, specializing in human rights and artificial intelligence. Uh, Karen Riley uh, works with, she's worked a, uh, quite a while on digital rights and she, she now works with startups, uh, working on digital security and managing people and code and projects. Um, and then we have Deborah Brown from the Association for Progressive Communication um, and the audience. Okay, um, if I can move over to Amane. Yeah, please. All right, so can you all hear me? All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm gonna quickly do an introduction on the concept of algorithmic bias, uh, which is obviously linked to algorithmic systems. 
Um, so algorithmic systems are computational and predictive technologies that are to be found within the umbrella term that is AI. Um, so that means that automating decision-making processes used by computer programs are used to identify patterns uh, that then can be useful for decision making. So ML, machine learning systems, uh, they process large amount of historical training data and learn from these examples to detect patterns that can then be used as uh, decision making processes. But if the historical training data is incomplete or if it's not representative of a certain specified population, then sometimes biases can squell quickly and um, inexplicably across different AI systems, which can then further entrench discriminatory outcomes in other people's life. Um, so we, you would have a reproduction of culturally ingrained biases. Um, what, I wanna, what I really want to leave you guys with is the fact that algorithm systems are intrinsically situated in the social context where they are deployed and developed. Um, so that means that, first of all, they're not magical. Um, they don't predict the future. They just take the old and tell us something about the present. And that's where the provisions of the GDPR come into play. Uh, they, have, they have to be understood as safeguards um, for our rights, for our human rights. So the human rights that are here at hand with the equality um, and non-discrimination, right to information, um, etc. So as Alex, um, Alex said, uh, you, have, you find in the GDPR several articles. Uh, there would first be article number 15, which is right to access, and then article 22, which sets out a general prohibition of solely automated decision-making processes, except when you find yourself in different exceptions. And those exceptions are um, what are of interest to us today. Um, so I, this, is, this, this was my quick introduction. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Uh, I can go deeper into why uh, we have issues with historical training data systems, uh, what it actually means in, uh, in technical terms, and, uh, and why it's, it's important. If not, then I'll just leave the floor to my other colleague. So among the things that I've done in technology, I've managed bare metal infrastructure and developer teams. And so um, at, at the core of, of my anxiety on this subject is the issue of AI and its application as, as a social problem. But I'm not here to talk about uh, the divide between developers and sociologists. That is an issue where uh, technologists in general don't respect the social sciences. Um, they believe in moving fast and breaking things and thinking about the consequences later. A lot of these teams are not diverse. They don't represent the people that they're having an impact on, and that is a problem with all technologies. But when it comes to algorithmic transparency, speaking from the infrastructure perspective and the, the technology planning perspective, the things that keep me up at night are technologies that are not planned. What do we want to see in the world as a result of this code? And then where are these data stored? Um, are they documented? Because if you move fast and break things and just experiment and just have machine learning churn through data sets, and if you're surprised at what happens at the end of it, and you don't document where you got there, then how can you explain it in the end? And so a lot of the solutions to, to issues of transparency, of application of the GDPR, are really boring things like end user needs assessments, documenting your code, knowing where things are in the infrastructure. And I've seen things you wouldn't believe, 10-year-old uh, servers with critical data that are it's hard to migrate things off of, um, getting somebody to a mechanical worker to repair a fan because they don't manufacture them anymore. And then you put this massive human rights problem in the middle of that, and um, I, I weep for what can become of this. And so 
document documenting your code, knowing where things are, that's that's things that I don't hear in this. And I'd be happy to expand on this and tell more horror stories, but again, it's a boring subject. Apologies for the delay. I had to run from the other session. Um, yes, um, since I wasn't here before, what was the question? <laughs> Introduce. How do you understand algorithmic transparency or AI? Okay. Mm -hmm. You were originally limited to two minutes, but take some more if you need. Oh, yes. oh good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorena Yaume. I'm from Spain, based in Berlin. Um, I founded an NGO called Algorithm Watch. Now I found a new NGO called the Ethical Tech Society. And um, when I look at these technologies, I look at the human uptake of technology. Um, right now, when we talk about algorithms, when we talk about any type of automatization process, we are very much concentrated on the mathematical relevance of, um, of, of the system. We look at statistical bias, we look at mathematical problems in the formulation, um, and that's the first step, in my opinion. Um, because it always becomes, it, it, all those mathematical relevant problems uh, and biases that we know from uh, many, many years of research doing statistics and all this stuff, um, they become relative when it comes to how humans um, interact with the technology. Um, so just to put an example, uh, when you probably have heard about Compass, Compass was this software that was used uh, by many judges in uh, specific states in, uh, in the U.S. to, um, to make decisions about um, whether, um, whether uh, people should be uh, granted parole or not. So that software would create a sort of um, risk um, calculation about those um, citizens wanting to, uh, to be granted freedom on parole uh, by, um, by looking at the risk of them becoming uh, um, to performing any type of criminal uh, activity afterwards. And it was very problem it, it was problematized by um, ProPublica. And um, then a huge discussion started, and the whole discussion was about um, the mathematical and statistical bias in the software. And this is a, an important conversation. It's really important, um, and it's a first step in my opinion. And the second step would be to understand how are judges using that software? Under which circumstances are judges? Um, making a different decision to what is being suggested by the algorithm. Because in the very end, it boils down to the fact that we are um, dealing with a software that is not deciding, but is making, is assisting judges to make a decision. And to understand how this um, technology, that is, by the way, human created, um, is uh, interacting with human beings, and in which, uh, to which extent there is a path dependency, and um, there is a high granting of authority to the software, and under which circumstances quite the opposite is the case, it's important to understand where the um, factors of technology are out there that manipulate people and which other factors are people using to, um, to use this technology in, in both legitimate and not legitimate ways. And by the way, the interesting thing by, um, by, by the, this Compass um, software is, is there's a lot of research being done by a female scientist in Princeton, and she was olympically ignored during this whole conversation about the ProPublica uh, argument about the statistical bias of Compass. And the interesting thing that she did was analyzing under which circumstances judges would not follow the suggestions made by the, by the software. And in many cases, it came out that judges wouldn't trust the software if the suggestions made wouldn't fit with their own stereotypes. So sometimes, uh, it's also interesting to understand that technology is uh, a sort of excuse to uh, not have to explain ourselves, to not have to, to hide our own biases. So this ambivalence, this is some of the things that um, I look at.
Ah, perfect. Thank you. So we've had a, a really rich, I think, first set of interventions from the panelists. Since we're not going along with the original plan to do breakout sessions, I wanted to pause here and see if there are any questions or interventions from the floor. Hopefully, if you have an intervention, add a question for the panelists. And we can do a first round of questions um, now and then come back to the panelists for another round. I see one, two, three. I see three questions so far. So if we can go from the front to the back with the first three questions. And please introduce yourself first. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emanuela. I'm from Brazil, and I'm an Isaac Fellow. And what would I, I like to ask is about the Compass uh, software, because I think the decision about this software went to a high court in the U.S., and the conflict was about intellectual property, because they couldn't reveal the black box because of this. So I would like a comment on what do you guys think that could solve this problem, because you have, like, a private enterprise uh, doing something that is public, and that should be public, and you don't know uh, what are you being judged for, even if it's only recommendatory? Thank you. Um, thank you, Nardina Nimmer, PhD student at the University of Canberra and ISOC fellow. So my question is really related, it's just that as a social scientist I see that we make the assumption, not we, some social scientists make the assumption that the technology has an impact on making people more polarized or less polarized. In either direction, this is a very problematic assumption. But the question is, if we were to inspect the relationship between the makers of the technology, the technology and people's use, how exactly can we untie all these relationships? Thank you. Thank you, and we'll take one more before going back to the panel. Um, I think it's in the, the gentleman in, in the fourth row. Sorry, I can't see very well. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hello, Thiago from Brazil, uh, currently studying in the Netherlands, law and technology master. Uh, it's also a very similar question, is about this matter of legitimacy of this decision-make process, because usually I think that the, the idea of providing information, it helps to build this legitimacy so a court can rely on that, but at the same time, we are having these algorithms that uh, uh, work in a machine learning process that after some time, even the developer doesn't understand anymore uh, how, how the machine makes the solution. So how can this information that should be provided uh, make it clear for the, the justice uh, to understand and trust on that information that's being provided? Uh, I think this is a big challenge in this legitimacy process. Thank you. I don't think any question was directed towards any specific panelist, so free, please feel free to, to respond to whichever ones you, you'd like to. There's questions around intellectual property and the public-private sector dimension, um, one around inspecting the relationships between actors in the, in the systems, and the third around legitimacy of decision-making processes and ensuring trust and transparency there. Uh, so uh, I, the question about the, the, the cycle um, between the sociology and the technology, um, I was, I was in, the tr in a train, I was reading a German business magazine and there was uh, an executive from a big company saying, oh, AI for hiring is going to be great because there's no bias. And no. Uh, and recently, Amazon scrapped their hiring AI because it showed a preference for white guys. So if your company has hired majority white, cisgender, heterosexual men, and you put machine learning on top of that and say, okay, of the, the people that we hired, look at their resumes, the people that we hired, that's the definition of success, then you're going to get a machine that preferences people who are already privileged. And then those people are, are going to make the technology that goes into other systems for hiring, and then you're gonna have a system built for discrimination. And so that's, that's already a problem in tech, um, where as a tech manager, I used to say I'm, I'm a chief feelings officer because I was doing very highly technical work, but um, 
the, the difference between responding successfully to a distributed denial of service attack or making sure the hard drives got replaced in the data center was asking people, have you had coffee this morning? How's your blood sugar? Is, is the ambient noise level here? Do you feel valued in your work? Um, and you, you know, I used to talk to other tech managers and said, what? Feelings? No, ugh. But I work in computers. And so you have this already bias of, of tech ma makers. They don't want to deal with social stuff. In many cases, there's an element of programmer supremacy where they believe that programming is the highest endeavor that humans can achieve. And all these humanities people were just the ones who, could, who were slacking off and couldn't code. Um, lots of humanities people actually do code. And humans are a lot more complicated. If you want to talk about buggy firmware and weird software and legacy code, we're talking about tens of thousands of years of legacy code. Computers are easy. Humans are hard. So AI is not the solution yet. It can address a lot of issues. But unless we have a diverse set, a multidisciplinary project, to ask ourselves, what do we actually want to build? What kind of teams do we want to see before we apply this? It's just going to be new technology reinforcing age-old systems of oppression. Um, Compass, huh. uh, yes, it was a question of, um, of uh, company secrets, trade secrets, and this is one of the things that we've seen in many other cases. It's even a more relevant one, uh, which is about probabilistic phenotyping. When you do a DNS, when, when crime courts um, um, ask uh, specific laboratories to do a DNA test just to check whether a specific um, person was in the scene of, in the set of crime and so on. Um, what they do is that they run a specific software that they haven't programmed themselves, but they have bought that software. And uh, this has been the case um, that um, shows how complex those systems are, um, where the software was buggy, but the algorithm was fine. So at the very beginning, everyone was checking on the algorithm, and uh, everything was fine. Uh, the, the mathematical formula um, behind that sort of uh, calculation was being explained and it was clear that it was the correct mathematical formula that is used by everyone. And um, it took many, many years of fighting from the scientific community to just bring the company selling this type of software into court to make clear that code is not the algorithm, that there is a distinction between the mathematical formula and then the translation from code in, from, the, from the mathematical form, formula into code. That there is a step behind it. There are two different types of profiles behind those two different things, coding and creating algorithms. And um, the problems that we have there when we say um, it's a trade secret are precisely because of that, very, um, very problematic, very, uh, very crucial. When we talk about um, evaluating this type of systems, um, we need some sort of oversight that is able to look both in the mathematical formula and understand it, but also in the code and understanding. In the same way that Coca-Cola is being oversight, even though the formula is not being made public. So, um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to understand that argumentation that because of being a trade secret, not being scrutable. And this is a trend that it's starting to break because we see that more and more governments are talking precisely about this type of issues. Not mainly because they want to foster um, more openness, but in many, many cases because they are themselves applying this type of methodologies and technologies within their own services. And this is becoming a challenge for many of them. Um, um, overall, though, um, I would be cautious thinking that just by scrutinizing the algorithm and scrutinizing the software, you're fine. Um, this type of technology is very complex, and you're going to need a more holistic approach to understand where the problems are. And it does not start with the code and ends with the data. Sometimes you're going to need to look at the management processes and how the data is inputted and how the output is being interpreted to really understand where the problems are. I think evaluating software where, um, or we've been evaluating uh, with my former NGO, we, we had a campaign um, 
where we tried to make a partial auditing of the biggest scoring credit scoring company in Germany. And um, one of the things that came out very quickly is that the data might, might be right, the algorithm might be right, but the problem might lie in the fact that um, specific bank companies are inputting the data very wrongly, not because it's just a false equality of the data, but just because the process uh, that is being specified um, of how to um, transmit information from one point to the other is just a bad defi defined process. Um, just to put an example uh, with that credit scoring company, in the, 20, 000, in the, in the year 2000, um, we had, because of the commercialization of the internet, a new profile as a human being. And that profile was called the smart user. The smart user would compare things. Uh, before, it was very complicated because they would have to go uh, to different places because they didn't have internet and compare prices. But that uh, was obsolete with the internet and that had a real impact back to reality. So when they were asking for credits, they would go to different bank and ask for different conditions. But this type of profile wasn't conceived what usually happened in the bank companies was that they will ask to the credit, to the scoring company, um, they will demand the score for the person just to understand what type of conditions can I give to this person in front of me demanding for, his, uh, demanding for a credit. And then they would decide whether they um, offer a specific credit or not. Um, and technically what this meant in the year 2000s is that the credit scoring companies would just become um, just one request, person asking for a credit, and they wouldn't differ between requests for credit and credit considered, uh, credit given. So in the very end, what happened is that the smart user would go to two to three different banks, and at the very end of the day, his score would be very down below just because um, there was no specification of that part of the process. Um, so you see, that's an example of how there is an impact um, that is amplified by technology of bad defined process. And the problem is not technical, and it was solved very quickly. Thank you very much for um, the example uh, and um, going into depth of a case. And we want to flesh out from the audience cases in their countries, their sectors, uh, you know, their lives and where they work, uh, where the explainability of be it AI or autom automated systems and the explainability of decisions made by computers, where does it affect you and what are the challenges and opportunities? Um, somebody put their hand up? <laughs> yes, and you can introduce yourself. Okay. Just it, I think. Uh, hello. Uh, one thing that I would like to listen from you guys is how can you use, like we're talking about bad things here, so maybe we could talk about the good things. How can we use, for instance, our artificial intelligence to improve human rights? And I work uh, on a research that we are, there are a bunch of companies using, developing softwares to fight against uh, human trafficking using AI. And that is great research, and I think this kind of stuff, uh, we need to talk about it too, because then if you don't, AI becomes like a myth, a bad myth of robots that will conquer our life in a way or not. But I think you can do a lot of good. So I would like to hear from you guys, what do you guys think? And from the audience as well. I could respond like a decade ago in Africa, there was a debate about leapfrogging. So mobile phones were leapfrogging according to analysts certain stages of development and people would get online and um, suddenly access to information and markets change you could know what to bring to a market you could know your produce um, there was a lot of hype around it and we've also seen the, the negative aspects of mobile phones but I, I would com AI has been around for 60 years and huge computational power has been so you would have to you know be at a university and book computing time a big mainframe like 60 years ago. Um, now you can run AI on an edge device, on a Raspberry Pi, on a laptop, and you know, relatively cheap or free with the 
Google's open source library TensorFlow. I won't say it's entirely Google and, and, and other, and you can run it Amazon Web Services, um, Azure, so many places. So, so I think uh, we kind of have leapfrogged access to computing. And I'd like to see computing power. I'd like to see how that, that, that turns out in the developing world. So that's my contribution. Perhaps Emane? Um, no, I just wanted to say, uh, to go back to the questions that were asked before, that just like Lorena said, um, one of the things that we can use to go around this IP um, issue that some algorithms cannot be, um, are not open to the eyes of the public. You got several things to go around that. So first, uh, like Lorena said, we have the possibility to audit algorithms, even though that is not to be understood as a sufficient solution, it's a first step. And then uh, we also have um, the possibility to enhance the demand for transparency uh, when algorithmic systems are used by public actors. Um, and that demand, I think, has been heard um, in the last couple of years because you, you have governments that have um, issued reports on the algorith algorithmic systems that they use. Uh, they have issued reports on um, what in which fields they implement those algorithms, what kind of impacts they have on citizens. And so they are really trying to be transparent um, on, this, um, on this use of algorithms that they do. So you have auditing and then you have just tr transparency demands that can be enhanced just to make sure that there are no negative side effects uh, on AI because like, like we said, um, it can be used for good, but we need to make sure that it doesn't uh, structurally um, automate uh, biases and discriminatory outcomes. So, yeah. We have a question at the back. Um, Arthur, uh, Strathmore University, and I'm also working at uh, IEEE on uh, algorithms in the standards. Um, one of the issues that I'm looking at is uh, investigation of Chinese uh, f export of facial recognition technology for diversification of training data, um, especially in countries like Zimbabwe, Rwanda. Um, I wanted to find out uh, whether, what's your view on China going to Africa to harvest data for diversifying training data for algorithms, number one, or is the answer for algorithms training in synthetic data, because that's another new thinking at the moment. And also, what's your view on uh, the Google Dragonfly? Because I'm one of those people who think that I think it's a good thing for Google to go to China as a sort of like retaliation for what China is doing, because China is harvesting data all over Africa and from the global south. But why should Google not go to China to harvest Chinese data? Thank you. There were a few other questions in the back um, and one in the middle here on the side. So maybe if we can do another round um, and take a few questions at once. So in the back row, please. Thanks. Um, I actually have two questions, sorry. So one is um, obviously, you know, there's a convincing argument to be made that algorithms can uh, perpetuate biases, right? But our alternative is obviously human decision making, which has precisely those same kinds of biases because we're perpetuating them. Uh, I'd love to know what your answer is to that conundrum because uh, I'm from the U.S. and obviously we see this in the context of bail and parole where we have a real split in the uh, criminal justice community because some people think that we're going to get better outcomes uh, in racial terms out of these algorithms than we would from you know, the biased judge sitting down in Alabama. So I'd, I'd love to know what, the on, what your answer is to that question. And the second one is, so picking up on this idea of being sort of holistic in terms of evaluating AI, I'd love to know about any good examples that you guys may have of how this is done at the back end. So in the sense of once you have the system functioning, what are the opportunities for actually analyzing who it affects and what the outcomes are? and whether that gives us a way to go back into it rather than just auditing code and all of those complicated things. Thank you. Thanks very much. And just a reminder, if, if participants can please introduce themselves. 
And the next question um, on the wall is a woman in pink, please. Hi, I'm Iwana. I'm from the MLDI team from England. My question is about the cross-border nature of AI and the internet, because obviously there are already quite a lot of problems garnering transparency with algorithms. But my question is, how is that further complicated when we're dealing with this borderless internet, but obviously regionalized development of algorithms? And moreover, if there are any potential avenues you see to help provide solutions to this. I know somebody mentioned data storage centers earlier, and I'd really love to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Okay, uh, the person in the third row here in the front. That's you, sir. Um, hi, uh, I'm Nicholas. I'm from the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany. Um, I have a technical background. I do privacy and applications of AI to privacy. And uh, I was wondering, uh, there are different techniques. And I mean, AI is not only one algorithm and only one technique. I mean, you can have neural networks, you can have decision trees. And I would say that, for example, explaining how a decision tree works, it's way easier than a neural network. Um, how, what are we tackling when we say we have to be explain the algorithms? Are we, are we tackling the complexity of explaining an algorithmic model or explaining the code itself or what it does? Thank you. Could I, could I answer the, the last question? Okay. Um, so I think uh, it was John Searle in 1980 who, who talked about strong AI and weak AI. Uh, we also have uh, this, this idea of general, artificial general intelligence. Um, so, uh, but yeah, a, lo a lot of AI is, 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 is um, simple statistics and refining the statistics and, and it relies on the quality of your data set, et cetera. Uh, so, I, I don't like the term algorithmic transparency. I think it uh, like denotes some magic maths man or woman in a castle. I'm not good at maths. It scares me, and like um, it can't just be the algorithm. I, I, I talk about systems transparency, um, and then w w you have a computer system sitting on a usually complex stack, and you even have people systems around it. So. Um, yeah, and I think Karen has, has mentioned this about good good code and documentation and, and, and this sense. So yeah, I think unpacking is important and I don't think it all comes back to the algorithms. If we just focus on the algorithms, someone can say, well, here's TensorFlow, those are the algorithms. There's your explanation. Um, whereas there's a whole stack that it lies on usually closed source. So I'm a bit of a hippie and I would like to see algorithmic transparency mean that everything has to be open source. I don't think that's going to happen and yeah, if it was, it would be quality open source. So some type of middle ground. Um, I would like to jump into that um, because when it comes, w y you're right. I mean, we need to look at this at more holistic and have a more holistic approach. Though, when we talk about explainable, for instance, machine learning, we, 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 we have like two different approaches when it comes to about explain what this is, what, what it's doing. And right now we have this, um, a, a lot of science doing research on how to create explainable machine learning. And I, I don't like that, to be honest, because uh, what we are creating with that, it's a plausibilization model of the first model that we're trying to explain. So that, does no, that is not even an explanation of the first model, because if, you, if it would be, you could exchange the model. You, could ex you, do, you just could transform the one model to the other. So it's not even an explanation, but we call it explainable on AI, and it's like a cool aid which with, we feel better at the end of the day. Um, and it's, of course, a cheaper way to go with machine learning. But there is this very old-fashioned, almost forgotten way of approaching machine learning, which is interpretable machine learning, who we. And what does that mean? That means that um, engineers need to put some features into the code. It's more complicated. It's, from the economical perspective, 
more expensive because you have to do more thinking. And it's not about playing bingo with input and output, trying to understand what do you need to change in the input to make the specific output happen. And there comes uh, the example you were asking for the back end uh, example. And this is precisely what happened in New York. And uh, they were, um, New York decided they wanted to, um, to reform their um, electricity distribution system. And they, um, they um, asked a company to do that for them. And they started using expla uh, explainable machine learning. And uh, they could only um, better the, um, optimize the whole system for just 1%. It was a very expensive uh, thing, and it only bettered the system for 1%. It's pretty bad, right? Um, why? Because they didn't know exactly where, what, what the input was really doing and what type of input they needed to change to make a specific output better. So um, because they were feeling very bad about this whole m money, paid by the taxpayers, um, they decided to start thinking something like very, go back to the roots and try to make an interpretable machine learning model. And this is exactly what they did. They put a lot of effort and a lot of the money they, they, they had gotten on engineers doing special features so that they were very conscious about what types of inputs they had and needed and, and understood exactly what type of input they need to change to optimize the system up to 60% more. And this is a good example of how you can do things. Um, now, I wouldn't say that everyone should now in use uh, interpretable machine learning in their technologies, because it's very co it, it, it costs money, and not everyone has that money. And in, when it's not high stakes, I don't see a reason why you cannot just research and try and experiment. But when it comes to high stakes, when it comes to technology that is being applied in the public sector that has an immediate impact on the whole infrastructure of a society, then of course you need to have a better system that you really understand, that you can really scrutinize. And there is this uh, situation right now where most companies that are, by the way, also selling services to the governments, do not have the will, and perhaps do not only, uh, only, not only have the will, but do not have the resources um, to use interpretable machine learning. And this is a problem that's not an economical problem, it's also an educational problem. Um, and, uh, and we need to be aware of that. And uh, I, I would not say, um, let's not use um, explainable machine learning. Let's uh, only use um, non-black boxes um, uh, technologies. But um, right now, we need to decide, I think, in my opinion, what are the high stakes in society where we decide in those sectors um, we need a better understanding and a better accountability of the systems, and where are the sectors where it's fine to have competing models with different ideas where we might um, leave them to um, develop new technologies, to develop um, original ideas, and if uh, some problems are raised, they're usually easy to solve or uh, to identify because they are not high stakes. It's about the toaster. It's about things that are fine to experiment with. Thank you, and we're having a little bit of back and forth trying to get... Um, we have a remote, <laughs> remote speaker. Person. It's a funny story about systems, but we can't get on the IGF website to get the link. The <laughs> WebEx works, IGF doesn't, got the link. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna explain how this worked out. Um, Joy, can you hear us? Okay, um, from the audience until we get joy, I, I wanted examples from yeah, your home countries or sectors, etc. My name is Anne Leslie, I'm Irish living in France. I work for a private sector company called Pixio in the area of personal data. It's a question, open question to the panel in terms of incentives. There's somebody sort of famous in the financial services sector who says, you show me the incentive, you, sh <coughs> you show me the outcome. A lot of what I'm seeing is related to doing more of the same, faster and cheaper. And 
we can't say the world is in great shape at the moment. So doing more of the same faster and cheaper, is it really what we need? Um, left to its own devices, the private sector typically does that. It's short-term profit maximization. Are you seeing anything that is bigger than that, that it's a bigger vision, um, which is driving that forward, perhaps rehabilitating the role of the public sector, um, trying to go further than just those short-term objectives? Well, I think it goes back to the question that was asked before uh, about a AI for social good, and that is, a, that is more than a trend um, that has been there for maybe 10 to 15 years. So I reckon there are two different parallel um, dynamics that are going on, which is the one that you just described, and then the other one, which is right, really trying to applicate um, the AI umbrella, different techniques towards uh, social goods and to towards uh, the SDGs, for instance. So those are two different parallel dynamics, I would say. Sorry, we had some feedback from the mic. Come in, yeah. I, I think there are unanswered questions. So the, the panelists want to answer anything, do this now. So the, the question about, um, about discrimination, that, that humans will discriminate against people, we see this in the tax sector. The fact that every graduate from Howard University in the States in the computer science program, which I urge you, urge you to look at the, the website, um, they're doing amazing research, the faculty are amazing. The fact that Silicon Valley um, has very few people of color, very few black people working there, is a disgrace, and that's not a problem of AI. That's because people are discriminating in hiring. It's not only just overt racism, it's unconscious bias. And so some good applications of AI could be maybe going through uh, reviews and looking for words like abrasive and aggressive applied to, to people who aren't white dudes, who aren't white women as well. There's a great saying in disability activists, nothing about us without us. And that has to be the thing going forward. Yeah, I should not be speaking on this topic. You know, if the, and in terms of the, the justice system, you know, prison abolitionists, there, there are activists who are doing amazing work already. And if you're if you're a white prosecutor, maybe discussions with those activists will make you feel uncomfortable. Maybe uh, talking about white supremacy and white fragility in reactions to, to, to discussions about racism, um, some people are going to be uncomfortable in those conversations. And those conversations need to happen. Um, whether you're talking about machine learning or the way, the way systemic racism works, um, this is a social problem. Um, and we can see trends and maybe call for accountability, looking at the facts. Look, you use the, this word, this word abrasive or aggressive. You only use that for people who don't look like you. Um, that is a trend. Look, there's empirical data. But the solution to that is, is not going to be online. When it comes to gender discrimination in tech, uh, Google employees walked out over their handling of harassment and, and horrible, horrible things, including gender-based violence. Um, no AI can do things like that. So incentives, I, I would hope that we find incentives, but part of this is going to have to be punitive as well. It's going to have to be tech workers organizing. It's going to have to be people, if you honestly want to solve some of these problems, you're going to have to talk to activists who will make you uncomfortable. And people who don't look like me, <laughs> basically.
safety of algorithms important? Um, how transparent is human decision making important, like now in the institutions that we know? Um, so, Okay, so like we sitting with institutions I in many parts of the world or institutions, society that aren't transparent. Um, and so should we, should we make the standards for algorithms the same as for human decision making? And can we justify a higher transparency for algorithmic tools than we, um, than we do for humans? Um, and, and she agrees with me that the, um, the Transparency offers, offers little insight to most humans, and um, AI should maybe take the form of human practical reasoning. And, and a lot of our understanding of, of giving AI ethics is thinking that like computers can one day emulate the brain. Um, so yeah, Joy Lidicote, a researcher from the University of Otago, has uh, left some questions, which I'll share on Twitter afterwards. We have five minutes left in the panel. Um, we have. Somebody from the audience who has yes. Sorry, there. Uh, I'm Maria Pascanales, Executive Director of Derechos Digitales and Latin American Civil Society Organization. Um, I think we have heard a lot uh, in the conversation now and from the different panelists about the idea that we definitely need more transparency in any kind of form that have been described either in the algorithm or in the process. Uh, uh, at, at, as a whole. So my question to the panel uh, regarding the issues that also are really uh, the most relevant uh, right now in Latin America, it's about how we uh, kind of uh, find a way to um, move this conversation to a mainstream in a sense more political for the society at large in the sense that uh, we, uh, as before, we have, uh, related to this, the last intervention, um, we have procedures to uh, assess the transparency of human processes, and for that we have the democratic processes of society in general. Um, how we can move that type of conversation to this uh, field of algorithm uh, or uh, automatic decision making decision, uh, sorry, decision making, um, be part of this conversation of how we insert the concept of multi-stakeholder approach, the, the concept of democratic uh, participation in the building of the method of auditing or in the defining of what we want precisely audit. What are the ideas that you from uh, your different fields of experience can uh, provide regarding that more methodology approach to uh, move to some of the at least procedural solution to confront this issue. And we precisely uh, will be launching in a report that we do uh, about Latin American digital rights every year, Latin American in a glimpse, uh, a short uh, do document, a short paper that dealt a little bit in this idea of how we start to have that conversation in Latin America because this is urgent related to the massive use of uh, governments are implementing of different type of uh, artificial intelligence or algorithm decision making technology in the provision of uh, services and uh, with the purpose to achieve more inclusion. But we wonder how this also should be a political conversation. So that's my question. I'm just going to jump in really quickly to answer um, your questions with some elements. Um, in my sense, I think the first step needs to be um, a literacy common effort on uh, machine learning systems. Um, we need all to be aware of what AI actually is and then we need to deconstruct the myths that we have um, touched upon during the panel. So. Whenever you read a newspaper article, for instance, that would go as, you know, you have a title that would go as, this algorithm showed bias against women. Well, it's partly true, but algorithms, they don't have agency, for instance, so they don't have an agenda. Um, it's the people that develop them and deploy them and apply them then that have an agenda. So, but 
I'm not sure the public knows it all, and they're they are being um, they are being uh, nourished with some perspectives on AI and some fears and concerns and worries uh, around the systems that are unclear and opaque. So I think that the first step, if we wish to, for that conversation to be public and democratic, needs to be about enhancing the education and the literacy about those, um, those systems so that we are all on the same page and can really you know, discuss within a multi-stakeholder and cross-disciplinary um, session. So that's Joy, can we hear you? Okay. Okay. Um, the time. Okay, five minutes. Yes. Hello, I'm uh, Chinmay. I'm sorry I missed the train. Um, but it's, it's nice to be able to participate in this conversation a little bit. I'm a little concerned about um, the idea that we're thinking of AI as uh, mirroring human intelligence and therefore as uh, something that we might consider opaque. Um, Karen, I think that what you said earlier, you, you discussed the bias of the human mind. And I think with AI, what's likely to happen is that we'll see it at scale. If you look at the world around us, what we're all using in a granular way around the world is really technology developed in the US, right? We're all subject to what Facebook and WhatsApp come up with. And the accountability for these systems is it's really only in the US. So Cambridge Analytica may have happened all over the world, but Mark Zuckerberg only answered to one country's government about why, why it took place. I think, I think it's important to think about AI from that point of view and to think about what it means um, concretely for the lives of people. And so for me, um, I'm, I'm curious about what you think. I was thinking that transparency actually will have to be a question that we consider um, bearing in mind what we're going to do with that information, who is going to hold the companies accountable, right? So you might disclose a series of things about AI. It might be that people don't understand the technicality of it. Uh, one might break it down, might be that people are illiterate, and they are in many countries around the world. So the question is, what are the different stages that we can come up with in the context of transparency, and what do, it's like transparency plus what, right? Yes, you're right. I don't think that transpar transparency is just the first step. And it's, uh, it's not an end in itself. It's not a value in itself. The Saudi uh, government is very transparent about uh, and very democratic about censorship. They have a website where everyone can join and say what should be censored next. Uh, so um, it, it needs more. And uh, I, I'm, I think that we're at the very beginning of a broader conversation. And we started with transparency, and uh, we will need to, we are st right now trying to identify what we mean on the transparency, to whom, and for what purposes. We're just in the middle of that. Um, and at the other side, we're very much forward in the conversation when it comes to um, understanding what we want, what we consider fair, and what we consider unfair. And I think, just to come back to your point, um, the conversation already started. And I don't think that you need to understand technology to understand what is fair to you and what is not fair to you. And it should be all about that. Because when we go to the supermarket, we don't, know, we don't need to know about biochemistry to buy a yogurt. We don't need to, 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 to know about engineers to enter a plane. Um, so I think that it is morally fair to just, talk, to, to just demand from people what they can understand as a common ground, as a common knowledge, and there are things that go beyond that. So I don't think that um, the citizens can audit algorithms. They will never do. Uh, in the same way they cannot audit a yogurt, they cannot audit a car. And that's fine, because that's fair. It's way too complicated, and our lives, our everyday lives, are already too complicated. We have institutions for that, and um, we should tra try to transform uh, all these new technologies that, by the way, are in every sector. There is no single sector in society that is not going to be permeated by those technologies, and we already have oversight in every sector. So the question is, are they, uh, do they have the... The, the, the instruments to 
scrutinize this new technology being, appra being applied in their environment? Are they able? Do they need to reform their, the law? Do they need more people? Do they need specific new profiles in their institutions to evaluate from that perspective? But we should not, only, we should fo we should not forget on the other side that this is um, a technology that demands the most interdisciplinarity of all technologies ever before. Because this technology supplies specific sectors, and to understand and scrutinize that technology, you don't only need a mathematician, an institution, but you also need the person that is able to make sense of the output being given by the algorithm, and that is usually a person of the sector. It can be a psychologist, because this is a tool uh, applied uh, software being used by psychologists to make some sort of risks uh, calculations. It can be uh, a marketer. Uh, that is using specific technology as a marketing professional in, in his company, uh, or it can be a human resources psychologist that is using specific HR software. That is the person that will be able to tell you whether the output makes sense or not, and not the person in controlling and not the data scientist that has been part of the programming but is not able to understand the context. So. Um, the conversation is already there. We don't need to understand uh, the, the things, but what we need to discuss is what are the values in the light of these new technologies that are bringing um, problems that we had before but are being now amplified by this technology. And one of the things that I think we need to have more and more in this conversation where the Western can learn more about the South is the question of the public good. Because this technology is very um, collectivistic. It does not understand individuals. It's a technology that sort of tries to um, manage collectives. And um, Western societies are very individualistic. The law of Western societies are very, is very individualistic. And when we try to scrutinize this um, technology, we get into the scrutinization from a very individualistic perspective. We talk about human rights, those are individual rights. But there's a lot uh, of harm and an impact of this technology being caused at a collective level. In L such a way... Lorena? Sorry. I interrupt, sorry. We I'm at sorry. the end of the session. Oh, very um, good. I think Lorena pointed to a very important point. Like, as I, AI uh, infiltrates or becomes part of literally everything we use, we have to build a workforce around AI, build capacity around AI, and build our people where. And I hope that you people in the session are part of that initiative. Thank you, Chinmayi was our other panelist from National Law University, Delhi. She had, like many people, some travel um, problems. So yeah, we need to build a, a workforce in AI, we need to build capacity in AI, we need to build understanding of AI, um, and you know, go to the AI sessions, um, go to all the AI events also on Thursday, and everybody's you know, input is valued in a world of ubiquitous AI. Thank you.